I'm Larry Warren. I wanted to take you through a little view of treating endometriosis non-surgically without drugs, without surgery. Is there actually a natural treatment for treating endometriosis, something that actually has scientific backing? We're going to take a look at that now. The first thing that we generally hear is, why do I hurt so much? This is unacceptable. And then beyond that, will I ever have children? Really, I'd like to be treated, but is there a natural treatment? Anything that can help the pain and the infertility without drugs or surgery? Something that actually has scientific backing? Is there something that treats the cause and not just the symptoms that I'm getting? It really comes down to how do I judge which claims are real and which ones are without merit? You know, the truth relies on public science, we know, so is there actually science of treating endometriosis naturally? We see so many different techniques, cures and suggestions for treating endometriosis naturally. Some of these sound very nice. Turmeric we know helps with inflammation, green tea can help, so Resteverol or polyphenols, acupuncture we hear can help with pain so many times, uh, progesterone cream, TENS is an electrical unit that helps block pain signals, omega fats have been offered, Chinese herbs, certainly an anti-inflammatory diet is good for you, but how do we really know it works? We really want to look towards science to see what scientific evidence is out there for this or any of these. We want to know what causes the pain, what causes the infertility, and having understood that, what can we do to possibly reverse that process naturally? Let's look at the organs that are mainly involved in this. Here's a perfect uterus that we're seeing the full uterus on the left side with the cutaway version on the right side. We can see shaped like a butterfly. It's really beautiful. The, the body of the uterus in the middle, that larger part with the fallopian tubes going out to each side. These delicate organs, they look large here, but they're designed to carry a single cell. They're designed to carry an egg that is picked up by the most delicate flower petals you can imagine. Those little fimbria they're called at the ends of the fallopian tubes designed to grasp a single egg, a single cell, and take it into the tube and bring it down the tube where the sperm come up and unite with that egg to create life. So. As we are born and as we grow up, that uterus is clean, mobile, functional, ideally. We've learned that adhesions form whenever we heal and wherever we heal. Adhesions form as a mechanical process. It's laying down tiny strands of collagen, like strands of a nylon rope. These little strands come rushing in whenever there's tissue damage or inflammation, as occurs with endometriosis. And these little strands surround the tissues that have been damaged and lay down and help the immune system start the process of healing from infections, injuries, and surgery certainly, and endometriosis. Probably surgery and endometriosis are the two largest causes of those adhesions. They can form anywhere. They can form between structures here. There's adhesions shown actually within the wall of the uterus, and we'll see some film later that shows what happens when they occur there, and your physician cannot see them there. These are microscopic, but they are stronger than steel by weight. They have been estimated at about 2,000 pounds per square inch, shown here and blow up as forming between muscle cells within the walls of the uterus here at the cervix at the entrance part of the uterus. But they can form there. They can form between structures, between your tube and your ovary, between your tube, your ovary, and your bowel, 
or your uterus. We've treated women with kissing ovaries where the adhesions were binding each ovary to the other behind the uterus. And so they, they can form just anywhere. In this slide, we see a blow up of some endometriosis. Endometrial tissue, the tissue that comes out of you every month during your period is found in other places in the body. Here, some on the ovary with a blow up box showing that. Some endometriosis being shown on the ovary at the left and a little bit on the left side of the uterus. We'll see more of that along and along. So adhesions can form with endometriosis or they can form between structures within the uterine wall. Let's look in this presentation at adhesions that form with endometriosis. We know that adhesions create glue-like bonds on and within the delicate reproductive structures. They can form at the sites of endometriosis anywhere in the body, and they've been found in people's arms. They've been found in people's eyes. Okay, it's this endometriosis that has matriculated anywhere in the body. We believe that the pull of these powerful strands reveals a major cause of the pain. Here is a front view, or a view from overhead. Here is a side view of an endometrial implant, some endometriosis with adhesions. As the endometriosis is swelling each month, it is pulling on the underlying structure, causing pain, causing infertility. They glue down structures that are designed to be mobile and free. It's important to note that adhesion formation is what is called in medicine a mechanical process. The mechanics are pulling on the organ, sometimes wrapping around the organ, causing problems. Reversing a mechanical problem requires a mechanical approach. That's certainly what your physician uses when he or she suggests, let's go in there and do a laparoscopy, find out what's going on, let me cut or burn the endometrial tissues that I found and the adhesions that so often accompany them. Let's just clean the area out so that we get you back to a clean structure. Well, that's fine, and that's a, a, philosophically that is a an excellent idea. Unfortunately, post-surgical adhesions can form whenever the body heals from the surgery. So no matter how brilliant, skilled, wonderful, and compassionate your surgeon is, we find that most gynecologists are that way. Adhesions formed naturally as the body heals from the very surgery that is sometimes designed to decrease adhesions. In a five-decade study of about 250,000 patients uh, published by digestive surgery, adhesions formed in 55 to 100 percent of pelvic surgeries and in 90 percent of abdominal surgeries. So your surgeon really has the deck stacked against him or her. That's why sometimes we'll hear, well, surgery helps for a while, but then they, it came back. We don't know if it's the endometriosis or the adhesions, but we do know that this is statistical data from uh, several hundred thousand patients um, over a several decade study. My wife and I have been investigating a mechanical approach to physician-referred chronic pain patients for over 30 years now. What we noticed is while treating patients with chronic pain from adhesions, women with endometriosis were reporting to us some really startling results. Significant pain decreases and even infertility reversals. We were surprised by that and it happened so often that ultimately we realized we had to investigate this scientifically. 
Joined by physicians and scientists, we learned that as we detached adhesions, the pain decreased and organs seemed to return to their normal function. Uh, here's one woman that we treated. She had severe endometriosis, stage four, and she was reporting being pain-free. She had had two failed IVFs, multiple surgeries, and she had two babies naturally after we treated her. So that was kind of waking us up to the fact that this is something we really need to investigate. We knew we were treating the cause of the pain and infertility associated with endometriosis. We were treating adhesions. We were taking organs that were going from a very adhered state to one that looked more like this, free from adhesions, and the cause of so much pain and infertility. We actually have good data on this. So how are we doing this? And can we repeat it time and again? In short, is there verifiable science behind what we were learning? Were these just flukes? Or was there a way to actually help these women non-surgically and actually get statistical results showing that we were helping? Well, to find that answer, we have to go back in time. So I'm going to look with you at a, the history of this therapy, three decades of research and development, a story that is at once heartfelt, but at the same time scientific, and finally, most people think, pretty fascinating. Truth be known, this is actually a love story. That is a photo of my wife and I at her second birthday, that's Belinda. Um, I was five, she was two at the time. And so we've known each other for our entire lives, grew up together in 1975, she graduated top of her class at the University of Florida as a physical therapist and began doing therapy and treating patients. She was associate professor at the University of Florida of Physical Therapy. And then at age 33, we got some terrible news. She developed cancer of the cervix. The cervix is right at the entrance of your uterus. The cancer was a pretty devastating diagnosis did not want her to die. At that time, physicians were treating this quite aggressively. They said, well, what we're going to do is put you into a lead-lined room and put inside of you at the full depth of your uterus and with some extra little stainless steel balls, there's a stainless steel cases filled with irradiated material at the full depth of your uterus in that tube and in those two little balls. And it'll be dangerous for the nurses to be in the room for more than five minutes at a time, but we're going to keep you in that lead lined room for three days and then have you come back again in a couple of weeks and do this again. So she was in a lead lined room, totally irradiated from the inside for 72 hours. This is now done a few minutes at a time in medicine. Back then, that was how they treated it. They wanted to cure the cancer. Well, they cured it the cancer, but massive adhesions formed in her pelvis. The cost to her was severe because, yeah, we cured the cancer, but there was a scar from the surgery. There were adhesions from being all over the most delicate tissues in her body being burned by radiation uh, concentrated for six days. Basically, the adhesions destroyed her uterus and her reproductive system and left her in totally debilitating pain. She could not walk, move, or breathe without pain. When she went to the physicians and said, oh, I just can't walk, move, or breathe without pain, they said, oh yeah, well those are adhesions. You have severe adhesions now, you've developed those. Um, your organs are all glued together. This is called a frozen pelvis. Really, surgery won't help. You don't want us to do surgery there now. You're just gonna have to learn to live with the pain. We really couldn't accept the fact that nothing can be done. What a diagnosis. So, so we started studying adhesions. I mean, I loved you so much. We're getting ready to get married when all this happened. 
What we learned were that, yeah, adhesion started forming at her pelvis, but then they started to grow. And as they did, they started wrapping up into her abdomen, into her bowel, her small intestines, into her stomach, liver, pancreas, all of the organs of her abdomen and pelvis. The more we studied adhesions, we realized, well, you know, that little glue-like part of the adhesions, the part that adheres them to other tissues is, is actually a molecular chemical bond. And even though these strands themselves, shown in white, are so strong, like the strands of an nylon rope, they're about 2,000 pounds a square inch, those bonds, we thought, might be susceptible to detaching. We decided to focus our therapy on trying to detach the adhesion strand by strand from those little attachments that were seemed like our most vulnerable point. As we developed and modified this approach to treat Belinda, we found out we could profoundly decrease her pain and increase her function. It was actually working. So our focus at that time was, and remains today, just decreasing adhesions. After several years of education, research, and development, Belinda was pain-free. She returned to work full-time, more than full-time. We started treating patients with problems due to adhesions. And then something really unusual happened. Women with endometriosis started reporting profound relief from menstrual and intercourse pain. They'd say, oh, Larry, my period came. I, I didn't even know it was coming. It's, I've been bent over for two days a month since I first started having periods. I didn't even know I was having a period, and it came. Not only that, we learned we were opening totally blocked fallopian tubes. And we knew that adhesions were the primary cause of tubal blockage. So between the fact of women with endos reporting surprise periods with zero pain, and women with adhesions and blocked tubes having one or more babies, which started to happen, despite diagnosis of total infertility, as they had totally blocked tubes, we thought, wow, this is something we really need to investigate further. So we notified the gynecologist in our town. It is a very medical town. It's where the University of Florida, a large medical school um, in Gainesville, Florida. And the chief of staff of the local hospital called me in, and he said, Mr. Warren, I'm, I'm a gynecologist surgeon and researcher. I have been a surgeon for 30 years a good surgeon, what is this claim of opening blocked fallopian tubes? So I showed him half a dozen charts. He looked at one, he looks at another. He looks at me and he said, Mr. Warren, you're doing things with your hands I don't think I could do surgically. And I, I'm a very good surgeon. Are you doing any research on this? I said, no sir, I'm not. Would you like to do some research? He said, well sure, that'd be great. He said, Mr. Warren, we really need to investigate this further. I said, great, how do we start? He said, well, he explained to me that uh, there's a dye test called an HSG where we take some dye and through a straw shown here, it's a, kind of a straight line in the middle, we inject this dye into a woman's uterus while we're filming her under x-ray. That dye shown here in black actually goes through the tube on the left hand side and doesn't go through the tube on the right hand side, it stops. So we can tell, gee, you know, it's great that you're helping women with endometriosis and some of them we realize don't have blocked fallopian tubes, but we're thinking that it's the same thing, these adhesions, that causes pain and infertility for them that is blocking fallopian tubes. This test will give us a very easy way to understand and to judge and to measure whether or not what you're doing is a fluke or whether it's real and whether we can reproduce this. So we took a woman who had totally blocked fallopian tubes. The, here the dye is shown as white 
and that is the inside of the uterus, so you can imagine the uterus surrounding it, but that is the area on the inside of the uterus, and the dye is going up through these little horns, but not going any further into the tube than that. So those tubes are totally blocked. In addition, we will see that uterus is really squeezed shut by adhesions. It's kind of like it's in a straitjacket compared to the after film where that uterus is suddenly wide open, no longer squeezed by adhesions. Not only that, the dye is going all the way through the tubes and spilling out into the pelvic cavity. So it was really cool. We could do dye tests and say, you know, we helped with this one, we didn't help with that one. Um, we could start measuring things up. So when we saw films, we would see what they looked like before and after therapy. And as I mentioned, the fallopian tubes was one thing, but even just looking at the difference in the uterus. When you want to have a baby, do you want that uterus to look like the one on the left, which is squeezed and constricted by a straitjacket of adhesions, or do you want it to look like the one on the right, the one that you were more born with, one that is free, mobile, and functional? During this time, one of the doctors who was looking at our films called his father. The father was a researcher at the U.S. National Institutes of Health. He said, Dad, you need to come down here and see what these people are doing. They're doing this with their hands. This is pretty remarkable stuff. They're taking women even that have hydrosalpings where the little fimbria, those delicate fingers, those delicate flower petals that are designed to grasp a single egg have been closed by adhesions so they're no longer able to grasp an egg and opening them up. And so we know that because this woman came to us. She only had one fallopian tube. It was totally blocked looked like the one you just saw filled with fluid with her. They said we won't even do IVF. Um, we treated her and she had the little girl on the left naturally and then she had twins also naturally afterwards. So we were learning that the therapy lasts. We did publish, by this time we were publishing in fertility and sterility. This is a poster presentation that we did for the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, the Society of Reproductive Physicians in 2006, showing that we cleared um, fallopian tubes with hydrosalpings, that's that swelling. We also did another one at the same time on treating endometriosis pain with a manual physical therapy because we were seeing so much improvement for both intercourse pain and period pain and we saw significant decreases in pain before menstruation, at menstruation, with ovulation, and with intercourse. So these were our earliest studies and attempts at studies, pilot studies really, back in 2006. Um, here is data from the study. If any of you are statisticians, it gives the values the probability that this could have happened by chance. The chance that this could have happened by chance was eight out of a thousand. Okay. Um, the chance that the intercourse pain would be decreased so significantly was one out of a thousand. So statistically highly significant. And we did publish on improving sexual function, something that we weren't really trying to do. This is improving sexual function in patients with endometriosis. Here we were showing statistical significance. That is a biostatistical term. That means basically it's real in science. Uh, women were having first time orgasms. We were increasing and improving desire, libido, orgasm, arousal, lubrication, and satisfaction and decreasing pain significantly in these patients. Um, here is some of the statistical data 
on improving those six domains of sexual function, all of them pretty much off the chart for statistical significance. Um, this time the National Institutes of Health invited us to a conference of world experts in endometriosis. Now, we're still pretty new at it. We had just published our first few studies and citations on treating endometriosis. And we were in a, found ourselves in a room with 400 physicians from around the world. There were a few other providers and us. And they were discussing how we judge success with endometriosis. And do we just do pain? And do we have to do surgery to create a diagnosis of endometriosis? And we suggested that we look not just at pain levels, but at quality of life, and the, that was resoundedly turned down by these physicians. They wanted to look at pain. Granted, pain was a lot easier to quantify, but we felt like quality of life was something that we were seeing very significant in our populations. At any rate, during this presentation, I stood up and I said, I, I just, we're a little new at treating endometriosis, we're doing well. Is there a consensus in this august group of physicians of where the pain comes from with endometriosis? The response was total silence. And finally, Alice Domar, Dr. Domar from Harvard turned to me and she said, we don't know. And we thought, that's remarkable because it was pretty obvious to us at this point where the pain was coming from was coming from the adhesions because as we were treating adhesions we were treating the cause of the pain and in infertility and pain was decreasing dramatically as we just showed. We knew that medications, birth control pills that stop swelling stop the pain. So further indication to us that the pain was coming from the pull of adhesions our focus was to detach the adhesions, and we noticed that as we detached them and treated that area, as we were detaching adhesions in other patients, and it was helping them with their pain, with our endometriosis patients, as we detached the adhesions, the pain decreased dramatically, sexual function improved, and their normal structure and function improved. And they went back and started having babies. So we realized that surgery could often help, but as you have heard if you have looked into surgery for endometriosis, as skilled, compassionate, and wonderful as your doctor is, surgery is so often a temporary fix because adhesions can return to help the body heal from the very surgery that you had. So you may hear Yes, the, the surgery really helped for a while, but then the pain came back a few months later, a year later. It was back, and it's because adhesions form as the first step in healing. Here is an image of adhesions forming from endometriosis, surgery, some post-surgical scarring, on the side of a uterus. Adhesions form and can even form on the walls or within the walls of the uterus as we saw in an earlier slide. Here in this image we see something that we've already seen before as an x-ray. This is what we see going on with a uterus where a woman has had pain. That pain is caused by adhesions. Those adhesions are also squeezing the uterus, creating an inhospitable environment for implantation, causing spasm, increased temperature. It's just an unhealthy organ compared to the organs after we treated and were able to relieve adhesions. By this time, Mary Lou Balwig, the head of the uh, National Endometriosis Association, had joined our uh, board of advisors. She suggested that we submit studies to the Journal of Endometriosis, which we did, on decreasing dyspareunia, that's intercourse pain, and dysmenorrhea, that's menstrual pain in women with endometriosis. We published there 
uh, in 2012. In 2014, we did a follow-up because we wanted to know how long the success was lasting, how long the decrease of pain and improved function was lasting. Surgery and surgical studies, we found they, they would come back four months later and then 12 months later, so we did the same thing. Patients available for follow-up maintained improvements in both dyspareunia and dysmenorrhea at four and 12 months following treatment compared to the pre-treatment values. So we were doing basically similar to surgery, but without surgery. 2015, we published a 10-year study of nearly 1,400 infertile women that we had treated. Our PhD looked back at all of these women and found that she could divide them up into categories. At the top, we were testing women for blocked tubes, and we had a 61% success rate there, 57% pregnancies. Uh, endometriosis, which also included women with blocked fallopian tubes and endometriosis, the success rate was about 43%, and you can see some of the other success rates there. Success rates with some of the other conditions are shown here. We were surprised that we were able to help women with high FSH. These are women who were refused IVF because their FSH levels were so high. 39% of them became pregnant, most of them naturally. And uh, the women that we treated bef within 15 months before IVF transfer, 56% of them became pregnant. So this was pretty darn good for people that are just using their hands. No drugs, no surgery, 20 hours of a manual therapy. It's usually done two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, so four hours a day for five days. So people fly in on the weekend, we start Monday morning, they're done Friday afternoon. These are the results that we see. With blocked fallopian tubes, uh, if a woman had not had surgery on her tubes, we had 69% success rate opening those tubes. Uh, about half of that for women who have had surgery on their tubes, uh, which made the 61% overall success rate. I already mentioned the pregnancy rate. Women that came to us before IVF, uh, Society for Assisted Reproductive Techniques, um, divides women and classifies them by their age group when they're going through IVF. On the left, under the white numbers, are the national success rates for post-transfer pregnancies. If we treat them, their pregnancy rates increased pretty significantly, about one and a half times, 56% overall. We can see Shown here in graph form, you can see in the dark blue the national success rates and how they decrease the success rates for IVF after transfer. Once you actually get to the transfer stage, these are the success rates nationally. How they decrease down to 9% for women above 42 in that age group. If they, we treated them first, their success rate was 44% above the age of 42, almost five times, and the p-value probability that could have happened by chance is about one out, less than one out of 10,000. Significant p-values throughout, so if you know a biostatistician or you are one, you can have that explained to you. All good therapies that are publishing should list their adverse events, what are the risks, what can happen to me. Certainly your doctor will give those to you if you're going to have a surgery. But um, so we did look at our adverse events and we're treating in one area for 20 hours over the course of a week. We get some temporary abdominal tenderness and some temporary ab back or hip pain that occurs, some of those adhesions, they'll, they'll pull all the way into your low back, pull your vertebrae forward and cause low back pain. So as that's freeing up, you get some soreness back there. Those were our two main adverse events. Uh, none of our adverse events were serious. 
we were surprised that some of our side effects were so positive, and positive sexual side effects. Uh, improved or first time orgasms in 64% of the women that we treated. Lubrication went up 79%. Desire or libido improved in 71%. Um, pain decreased in a whopping 93%. Here that is in graph form. This woman came to us with stage four endometriosis. She had well over 10 years of pain. She had had many surgeries to address her endometriosis. She had two failed IVFs. Um, after we treated her, she had two natural pregnancies and births. No IVF involved. Those are her children so far. We don't know if she's stopping with two or going on. If you'd like more information, you can certainly find more information at our website. It's pretty extensive. It has about 500 pages. It's just facts. We're not trying to sell anything. We're just trying to tell the truth. That's why we go through all of this with creating studies so that people can decide for themselves whether this makes sense to, the, to them or not. I like being able to look people in the eye and say this is what we know and this is what we don't know. Also at our website you will see a group of a dozen or two uh, videos of patients telling their own stories about what it's been like for them. We have a section on endometriosis pain explaining that as well as a page on endometriosis infertility showing some of the babies that we've that we've had. We're now at 1,000 babies born since we started first treating female infertility in 1989. So, a lot to go through. When you wonder, is there a natural treatment for endometriosis, pain, and infertility? Is there something that does not have drugs or surgery? If you're not interested in drugs or surgery, you want something natural that actually works and has scientific backing, something that treats the cause and not just the symptoms of endometriosis. You now know what's out there and how well researched it is. So we suggest you follow your heart, but look for the truth. Find credible sources. Do they have scientifically proven results? Take the time, it's so important, your pain your quality of life, your future family, for you to investigate fully so that you can make a truly intelligent and informed decision. Well, thank you very much for your time. We wish you the greatest of success in whatever you choose. And if you're interested, look us up or give us a call. Thank you.